Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. If you're tuning in from somewhere else, welcome to somewhere else. So, is your tree still up? Have you taken the Christmas tree down yet? Yes. Yesterday. <laughs> Some honest people here. I had the idea years ago of just getting a fake one, leaving it up all year, and just changing the decorations, right? So now we'd be putting hearts on the tree, then some American flags on the tree, and some pumpkins, maybe some turkeys later, and then we'd be right back around to Christmas again. Sounds like a good idea. Who's going to try it? <laughs> it's kind of crazy. It's now a little over a month since Christmas. Seems like yesterday, doesn't it? Maybe just to me, time is flying. And I heard a story about a boy on Christmas who was opening his presents. But this year, instead of the little name taggy things, the two from things, there were cards on the presents, more than usual, because a lot of his family members weren't traveling now. So, in lieu of their presents, they were leaving cards on the presents. Surprisingly, before tearing into the gift, he was actually opening them. He'd open up the envelope, but he did something strange with the cards. He pulled the card out, flicked it, threw it over his shoulder. That's peculiar. Did this about two or three times before the parents chimed in and said, Whoa! Don't you want to know who the gift is from? Don't you want to read the card? The boy ignored it, kept going. Open up the card, flick it, throw it over his shoulder. Finally, he opened up one of the cards, flicked it, and some money came out. The boy was quick to pick up the money, point to the portrait, it was Ben Franklin, he was doing well, point to the picture on the money and say, this is who the present's from. Now, I know that there are some Christians who do not celebrate Christmas the way we do traditionally here in America, and that's okay. We don't divide over that. We're going to talk about what it is to be non-denominational today and not dividing over things like that. So, if you want to celebrate Christmas, go ahead. If you want to not celebrate Christmas, you can bah humbug it. It's fine with me. I actually did this with a beloved Christmas carol on Christmas. I told you about We Three Kings. I humbugged it. I don't like it. And it's not just because you all sound like Sam Eagle when you're singing it from The Muppet Show. It's kind of pompous and that's annoying. But aside from that, it's biblically incorrect. It's not right. I told you this story. There's one king... And he's a really bad guy, King Herod. He wants to kill Jesus. <laughs> then you have, well, we don't know how many magi, magi means magicians, plural, in Greek. They're kind of like astronomers following a star. 
I have no clue. And then there's three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They worship Jesus. But we just don't know how many of them there are, and they're not kings. So what's the big deal, Gene? What's the problem? Well, not really a big deal with a carol. But it paints an incorrect picture of a biblical narrative for us. And it's simply just not a good habit. But I'll give you another example in case you're totally new today. There's something I always have to remind myself of. There could be new people here or people on the verse a day read the Bible in 67 years plan. So I'm going to assume that you might need another example is where we're going with this series. If you went to school here in America, you can probably finish this little rhyme. And I don't have to give you too much of it. In 1492, pretty good. We're going to have to practice that because you guys were all over the place. But you got it. <laughs> so in school, grade school, I guess, it's been a long time, you kind of probably learned something like, or you were taught, that Christopher Columbus discovered America. Then maybe you learned that back then, they thought the earth was flat. So he was going to risk sailing over the edge of it. Kind of worried about Chris. But then maybe later, you got to like high school, and if you were unlike me and you were paying attention, you might have learned that they really didn't think the earth was flat back then, if you were educated anyway. The ancient Greeks, about a thousand years before this, knew the earth was round. They knew about that. Also, you might have learned that he didn't land in Naples, Florida. The Bahamas, he made like three trips, I think, Haiti, Cuba, and then the east coast of what we call South America today. Hmm. Then maybe you learned a little bit more. And you learned that Christopher Columbus was not such a nice dude. He was not nice to the people in the places he landed. And so for that reason, he was chained up, brought back to Spain, who had commissioned him, and stripped of his titles. That's the rest of the story regarding Columbus. So much like the history on Columbus, most Christians have some of the basic points about the Bible down, maybe, but they're missing the rest of the story. Now, believing the wrong thing about Columbus, probably not going to have much of an impact on your life. But what if we believe the wrong thing about the Bible? What does that change? I'd say it might be important to fact check what we hear about the Bible. Read it for ourselves to get the rest of the story. Do we believe what we've been told about it or what we've read in it? Have we fact checked it? So it brings me to this series. I'm very excited about it. We've been working on it for a little while, compiling some of the ideas. I've been going through my Bible a lot for it and looking at all the different parts of it that people might not have ever read. Bouncing ideas off of actually long-time Christians. Some people at a pastoral level. And there are stories that even they don't know. And even at that level, there are things within the story that they think they know that they don't know. So we're going to look at the rest of the story. And I'm excited about it. So for today, an introduction is absolutely necessary because there are some things about the Bible itself that most Christians don't know. And I want to explain that to you, about how depending on what denomination you're in, you might have a different Bible. And I want to explain that to you. So if you're new here today, it's going to be a little bit more teachy than preachy, but I think you'll survive. So I want to invite you guys to the Bible study. Wednesday nights, 6 p.m. We worship at 5.30 if you can make it that early for about a half hour or so. And then Bible study is at 6 and we feed you pizza too. So it's kind of cool. 
We're going to take a look at more of the things here. I'm not going to use a lot of visuals today. We'll be doing that on Wednesday. We'll be doing show and tell, so to speak. We usually believe the picture that has been painted for us. There's what we've been told it says. Then there's what it actually says, like we three kings, for example, which in that case is really not a big deal, but it's a really bad habit. And when this habit is applied to the Bible, as it often is, we get what we think the Bible says, but it's not actually what the Bible says all the time. Here at C3, we say we're a Bible-believing church. So today, I want to take some time to help everybody understand what that really means. First, I'm going to pretend that everyone here is new and that you don't know the basics. I'm going to really zoom out and make it simple for you guys today. What is the Bible? If I had to boil it down into like a short elevator speech, the Bible is really about God's relationship with humanity, with people. Then, boiling down to a specific people group. You would know them as the Jewish people or Israelites early on in the Bible. Then it boils down to a specific person from that people group, Jesus, here in the flesh. So in the Old Testament, we have prophecies pointing to him. The New Testament is all about him, biographies about him, his church, and his second coming, what's going to happen, prophecy. Now, you may know that there's some prophets that point to him in the Old Testament, so there's like two sections, generally speaking, but you might not know that even people we don't think of as prophets prophesied about Jesus, David, Moses, Abraham. Jesus says this himself. It all points to him. You might know, even if you've never been in church, you're new here that Jesus was crucified, died, buried, rose from the dead. And when he came back, he had interactions with people. I told you in the past, he kind of scared his disciples. I think Jesus was funny, but that's an opinion. You don't have to believe that. <laughs> it doesn't say it in the Bible necessarily. At least I'm honest about it. He's walking along <laughs> on a road, and he runs into some people. Here's what he says. Luke 24, 25. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the Scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from the scriptures, that's the Old Testament, the way we think of it, concerning himself today. So, when we read this, I think most of us know that the original wasn't written in English. Do we know that? Okay, I'm glad you do. The rest of these people, I don't know what we're gonna do with them. <laughs> Jesus wasn't speaking English at this time. Maybe Aramaic? Fewer people spoke Hebrew back then, but definitely people spoke Greek. This is written in Greek. So I want you to understand this. It's very important when we approach the Bible that you have to put it in the language and the culture that it was written in. So Greek could be thought of like English is today. I know many people, I have many friends who speak English as a second language. Their primary language is Spanish, especially here in Southwest Florida. But the trade language of the area, right, we do business in, write in, is English. So we just have to think of Greek that way. No matter what anyone was speaking back then, Latin, Aramaic, Hebrew, pretty much, I could say hyperbolically, that everybody spoke Greek. That's why the Bible is written in Greek. Now, something might surprise you, even if you've been educated in Christian ministry, even some pastors don't exactly know this, that the whole Bible was written in Greek in the early church, both New and Old Testament. It makes a difference, too. 
It's the language of the day. It's not Hebrew, the Old Testament of the Christian church. When you look at the oldest manuscripts that we have of the Christian Bible, the Bible of the early church, it's all in Greek, all of it. The oldest complete copies that we have are in Greek. And that brings me to the story of the Septuagint. Some of you might have heard about it, and I'm going to explain how this works. Because when we look at the Bible, the way the church looked at the Bible, we see it rightly. It starts to open some things up for us. The story of the Septuagint goes something like this. About 250 B.C., so about 250 years-ish before Jesus, God in the flesh, came here on earth, King Ptolemy of Egypt wanted a Greek version, because it's a Greek-speaking world, of the Hebrew or Jewish, the way we think of it, scriptures. That is, the Old Testament. Well, a copy of it in Greek for his library. So he commissioned 72 elders or scribes to make this copy. And the story goes kind of like this. They went their own ways. They did the translations. And when they came back together, all of them were exactly the same. It was a miracle. Now, the way the early church, and I'll show you some quotes on Wednesday, thought about this was that it was a miracle. It was a Holy Spirit-inspired, divinely inspired version of the Bible, their scriptures, to point to Jesus. And in fact, when you look at the Hebrew manuscripts, it's missing some things, like the virgin birth. It's not in the Hebrew version. Interesting. The crucifixion prophesied in the Psalms, not in the Hebrew version. It doesn't read that way. But it reads that way in the Greek. So the early church thought that the Holy Spirit inspired these guys to write it so that it pointed to the Christ in a Greek-speaking world. Many people don't understand this, but it's the way they thought about it back then. It's all about... Jesus. Now, you might be surprised to find out that this has been in front of your face if you own a Bible the whole time. Interesting. I told you guys, you need to read your Bibles from the beginning and before you say Genesis 1. No. You need to read the introduction because the translators tell you exactly how they did it. And if you read the introduction in most modern Bibles, it'll talk about the Septuagint or the 70, 72 to be exact. And they'll say something like this usually, unless you're reading like an Orthodox Bible. If you're reading a Protestant Bible, they'll say something like, when translations were difficult, we used the Septuagint. Yeah, you had to. Otherwise, you don't get a lot of the prophecies. Kind of interesting. Now, if you're really paying attention, and you looked in most modern Bibles at the bottom, you would see LXX. If you know your Latin, you know that means 70. 72 to be exact. What they're talking about is the Septuagint. And when it happens in the New Testament, it's extremely significant. We talked about this in the Hebrew series. The authors of the New Testament quote the Old Testament constantly. About 33% of the New Testament is just Old Testament paraphrase. And every time... That LXX is there, and it points to the scripture they're quoting. What they're saying is they're quoting the Greek version of the Old Testament, not the Hebrew version. In fact, most of the quotes of the Old Testament are the Greek version. They're a little different, kind of interesting. Makes sense, though. If they're writing in Greek, why would they be reading any other version of the Old Testament but a Greek one? So, what we have to understand is that Greek is the language of the early Christian church, which is why I am so passionate about learning Greek. So, I can read what the disciples of Jesus were reading and writing, just as it was back then, unaltered and unredacted. I've been studying this for years, and as I look closely at the Bible of the early church, I noticed something else, that there were up to 14 more 
books in that Bible than we have in ours today. That was kind of interesting. What I was holding in my hand at the time was a Protestant Bible. That is, a Bible put together by Protestant denominations. But the Bible of the early church was different. Interesting. But I began to discover that all Bibles, up until the mid-1800s or so, included more Old Testament books than the most popular modern versions do. This was a mind-blowing discovery for me. So I started thinking, I want to read what the early church read. In fact, wouldn't it be a good idea to read what the early church read for, oh, I don't know, the first 1,800 years of its existence? I discovered that the cancel culture has been around for a while. Indeed, we live at a time when people want to delete history, not always realizing that it's already been done, even to Christian history and even to our Bibles. So I'd like to take a few minutes and talk about what these extra books are. This is not what the whole series is going to be about, okay, so don't fret. <laughs> but... I have to intro them for you because a lot of people don't know what they are. So these books are called Deuterocanonical. It's fun to say. A second canon. They're not primary, but secondary. These are Old Testament books which were originally, originally contained within and throughout the Old Testament, not as their own section, but then later parsed out by some denominations as their own section. And then these denominations call them apocrypha, or hidden. Ironic, because in some cases, that's exactly what they've done to them. Yet, these books are affirmed from the very earliest times in the church, and again at the Council of Rome, 382 AD, approximately 700 years before any significant denominational split before the great schism in 1054. This is the Orthodox and Catholic split. And then from the Catholic branch, you get all the Protestants. A lot of people don't understand that, that they're just Reformed Catholics. It's way before that. I like to study early history, way before it. So this is not a Catholic thing. So some of you may know about it. You might have learned about the Apocrypha thing. We probably taught something like those are the Catholic books. Right? If you read them, your eyes are going to light on fire. You know, like, don't look at them. <laughs> You've probably heard something like that, but it's wrong. That's not the correct history. It is not a Catholic thing. It's a Christian thing. In fact, <laughs> they are contained in Martin Luther's German Bible as well. If you're new, Martin Luther was an early reformer in the 1500s. Luther's Bible published the apocryphal books in the Old Testament in 1534, again, affirming their usefulness and belonging in the Bible. Here's a quote about the apocrypha. Martin Luther said, These books are not held equal to scriptures, it's his belief, but are useful and good to read. These deuterocanonical or apocryphal books are also included in the King James Bible as well all the way up until the mid-1800s. Again, we'll be doing some show and tell at Bible study, so if you want to see these things in their unaltered form, I'll be showing them to you on the screens. Undisturbed by cancel culture. You might be surprised that the apocryphal books are included in Lutheran and Methodist lectionaries up on the pulpit in the Methodist church and ask if you can see it. They're also in the liturgical calendar, these readings. So they're saying you should be reading these things throughout the year. Over 60% of Christians read from them. So it's safe to say that the majority of Christians read from these books today. And furthermore, think about it. 
just a little over a hundred years ago. All Christians were reading from them. Most people don't know this history, and it's kind of sad. Most people also don't know <laughs> that the writers of the New Testament were reading, referencing, and quoted directly from these extra books. So you're reading it if you're reading the New Testament, whether you want to or not. We'll look at it at Bible study more closely. And even if you don't think, as Luther did, that these books are Scripture, and they're not, well, don't you want to know what they're talking about in the New Testament if they're referencing them? How can we say we understand God's Word unless we understand what they're talking about? In a lot of cases, we don't. Jude's a good example. When you go home, a little homework, nobody's going to do. <laughs> Read Jude. Come back and tell me if you understand a couple of the things he's referencing. If you haven't read the apocryphal books, you can't. You won't get it. So are these books scripture? That's what you're waiting for, isn't it? I'm going to read you the C3 doctrinal statement regarding the Bible, what we think. We believe the Bible is holy and that it reveals everything necessary for our salvation. It is to be received through the Holy Spirit as the true rule and guide for faith and life. Whatever is not revealed in or established by the Bible is not to be made an article of faith, nor is it to be taught as essential to salvation. We believe that the 39 Old Testament books and the 27 New Testament books of the traditional Protestant canon are inspired and authoritative scripture. While we believe that the apocryphal or deuterocanonical books of the Old Testament may not be inspired scripture, we nevertheless hold these books to be of great value in so much as they are often quoted in the Bible and were in fact included in all English Bibles up until the mid-1800s. So, the point, like Christmas, we here at C3 don't divide over it. At a non-denominational church, we believe in letting the believer decide instead of a denomination making a decision for you. So here's where we're going to take a little turn and talk a little bit about what it is to be a non denominational church. Now, I might offend some people, but I've often said, I want to put on the website, we are not your church back home. <laughs> that is, any pastor in southwest Florida, this is what we complain about at lunch. <laughs> because everybody wants to make us something we're not, right? So they come in and they say, I want to join a non-denominational church, and what I want to say to 99% of them is, no, you don't. You want to join a Baptist church that took the name Baptist off the sign, but didn't change any of the belief system underneath it. We're a non-denominational church. So I want to talk to you guys about what that means. Very important, especially walking into this series. And I want you guys to help me with it if people come in that are new and have questions. So let's start here. Remember that Martin Luther quote about the Apocrypha? They were good to read, these books. He also had some things to say about some other books, both New and Old Testament. Easy to find, too, surprisingly. From Wikipedia, Luther had a low view of the Old Testament book of Esther, Scripture, and the New Testament books of Hebrews, James, Jude, and the Revelation of John. What? What? He called the letter of James an epistle of straw, finding little in it that pointed to Christ and his saving work. He also had harsh words for the revelation of John, saying that he could in no way detect that the Holy Spirit produced it. He's talking about the word of God there. Can you imagine a pastor today getting up here and saying that about the Word of God. What? <laughs> like Columbus, the rest of Luther's story is not known to many people. And I'd say it should be. 
This is what Martin Luther went on to say about the New Testament book of James, Scripture. He said, not me, we should throw the epistle of James out of the school. This is where he taught. Take it, tear it out of your Bible, and throw it away. For it doesn't amount to much. It contains not a syllable about Christ. Not once does it mention Christ, wrong, except at the beginning. I maintain that some Jew wrote it who probably heard about Christian people but never encountered any. Since he heard that Christians place great weight on faith in Christ, he thought, wait a moment, I'll oppose them and urge works alone. This he did. No, he didn't. False in many ways. You should find that offensive, anti-Semitic as well. James is some Jew, Jesus' brother. And yeah, for that reason, he probably met a Christian. <laughs> this stuff is out there. It's easy to find. Martin Luther definitely had some opinions that should shock most Christians today. And for good reason. So this should teach us that we should not always listen implicitly to the opinions of men. Just because they may have gotten some things right or have a denomination named after them. A lot of denominations have done Christians a great disservice by hiding things from them. We believe in your freedom to choose outside the primary gospel issues. Remember, we're a non-denominational church. The denomination is a group of Christians that have separated themselves based on secondary, that is, non-primary gospel issues, beliefs or opinions. This is the idea of developing a faction, a group of people who follow a person or opinion. Now, this, if you're very familiar with the New Testament, could be said is one of the Apostle Paul's, or Paul as he would refer to himself, an apostle and slave of Jesus Christ, one of his worst nightmares. If you know your New Testament really well, you know that this is a reason for writing Romans. Unity, lack of division, then between the Gentiles and the Jews. This is the reason for, reading, for writing Ephesians. Same kind of issue going on. If you know your Bible well, you know that there are other secondary issues they're arguing about. And you know what Paul says in Romans 14. Don't divide over it. Right? You want to do those things? Fine. But don't divide over it. It's not necessary. It's not gospel. This is a big thing in 1 Corinthians. Again, don't divide over it, your opinions. 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, that's the context, no matter what else he's talking about in there. That's the main issue. In the beginning, I told you about this recently. They're doing what I would call pastor worship. They're following after one teacher or another teacher, putting them up on a pedestal, putting Paul down. Apollo, see, such a wonderful and eloquent speaker. Is he preaching this Sunday? I'll go. If Paul's preaching... Not so much, right? That's what's going on here, and this is what Paul says. Pay attention in this context. 1 Corinthians 1.10. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Important. To live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some member of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Yes. Sadly, it has. 44,000 of them. It has been said that there are, sadly, 44,000 Christian denominations. What would Paul say to that? Today, some may say, 
I follow Luther. Here we say, I follow only Christ. I don't think a lot of Christians understand that. A truly Bible-believing church should be looking for unity like Paul was, encouraging its members not to follow people, but Christ and Christ alone. That's it. So, we here at C3 are a non-denominational church. We welcome and respect all Christians. In fact, everyone. That's what the Bible teaches. Regardless of what they believe, especially if they're members outside of the centrality of the gospel. I hear way too many, I talked about this at Bible study, Christians, admittedly especially from Protestant denominations, who say, if I'm being real with you guys today, stupid things about people from other denominations because they don't understand it. So bad that I had to put the Catholic statement of faith up on the screen because so many Protestants will say stupid things about Catholics. It's not good. And the Bible teaches us not to do that. Do they believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior? Have they confessed that? Do they believe that in their mind and their hearts? Yes, then they're saved. Protestants also, too, do a lot of stupid extra things that aren't about the gospel, but it does not unsave you. That's the bottom line. Imagine that. Imagine if we could be unsaved by something, by someone we prayed to, or someone we put up too high, maybe our spouse. Do we worship ourselves? Think about it. I hope that can't unsave me. I don't think so. We need to keep the main thing the main thing. This is Jesus and the truths about him. Everything else is secondary. I said in the past, we're a Bible-believing church. This means we hold the word of God in very high regard, not the opinions of people, no matter how hip or famous they are. We can see if you're reading the news how much trouble that gets us into, doesn't it? Even ones we think are really, really smart. I've seen them fall too. I will respectfully consider anyone's opinion. I'll listen. But I will not implicitly listen to a pope, a pastor, a priest, or a professor. Only the Prince of Peace. That's it. Jesus. And as we saw, even some people we consider heroes of the faith had had some pretty bad opinions about the Word of God. Which is why my only hero is Jesus. That's it. We're a Christ-centered church. That is what C3 stands for. Now, it's been said that the water is purest at the source. So this is why we study the Word so deeply, important, and early church history. See what they thought about it. And as we study that history, we see that the truth is that these extra books that I was talking about before were in all copies of the Bible in the early church, regardless of what anyone's opinions is of them today or are. Again, non-denominational means we're not going to keep these things hidden from you. It means that you have the freedom to decide based on the facts. And that's all I'm presenting Again, Bible study, I'll show you some of this stuff. It's interesting. I'll be giving you more facts, letting you decide some extra resources because your primary question is, well, how do I read these things? So I'll be showing you where you can read some of these things for yourself and letting you formulate your own opinions about them. And as I said before, it's not just the apocryphal books that we'll be looking at. The majority of this series will not be about the deuterocanonical books. I'm surprised I said that four times now without messing up. <laughs> it is just that we required an introduction here, and I do want to give you an invitation to the Bible study. On that note, my vision is that it will become more than just a Bible study. I want to make it Wednesday worship, which is why we worship from 5.30 to 6. So I'd like to see the room eventually as full as it is right now on a Wednesday night. So, 
Not just those books, but we've got to take a peek at them, let you guys decide. But here's the deal. There's a large majority of those scriptural 66 books that a lot of Christians don't know a whole lot about. A majority, which is why this series is going to be kind of long and we're going to have to take a few breaks in the middle of it. You'll get sick of the video. I won't. I really love it. Thank you, Dustin. Poor, poor guy. We get, we get to a new series. And I'm like, can you, can you do? <laughs> Katie's like, oh, no. Can you make this? He actually makes them. So aren't they good? <laughs> pretty cool. Yes, he's pretty awesome. But anyway, I drive him nuts. <laughs> It's been said that the Bible is God's love letter to us. Do we believe that? If so, we may have received the gift from God. But have we read the card? Like kids on Christmas, we're pretty quick to accept the gift, tear right into it, or do we? But have we read God's love letter to us? What do we love more? The gift or the giver? In this series, we'll be reading God's love letter to us where everything points to Jesus. We'll be looking at the Bible unredacted. You'll be hearing the rest of the story.